next speaker, Dr. Julia Twigg, is here all the way from the UK, from the University of Kent. Her book, Fashion and Age, was a vital resource for me in the research for the exhibition. And so I'm thrilled to hear her talk today, which is titled, Dress Embodiment and the Performance of Age. I'd like to start, as other people have, in thanking you for inviting me. It's been absolutely delightful to come here, and particularly delightful for me to be speaking in a very strongly fashion-oriented audience. Um, I've also been f particularly interested in many of the intersections. I haven't time to talk about them in this short presentation, but the intersections particularly between work on older women and plus size and also on modest dress. And I think I hope that will perhaps emerge when we look at the sorts of themes that I'm going to discuss in relation to older people. The perfect body of high fashion is young. It's also slim, beautifully formed. Frequently, but perhaps now a little bit less often, white. What it's not is old. Aging in the field of fashion represents a disruption of the visual field, a dereliction, a falling away from perfection and beauty as time's claw affects its damage. In this, it represents a form of Kristeva's objection that which is rejected, feared, seen as an aspect of horror. As a result, fashion and age sit uneasily together. Fashion's all about the erotic, the sensual, the edgy, the sexy, the exciting, all the things that age traditionally is not. In consequence, fashion largely avoids images of age. It's, it's off his visual repertoire. It's radar. This avoidance is reflected also in fashion studies. All too often, fashion studies shares the values and coded assumptions of the fashion system. They're complicit in its evaluations and in its silences. Fashion studies share fashion's judgments and estimations of worth. And among these estimations are ones that are biased away from age. As a result, fashion studies have largely ignored age as a social category. It occupies an area of silence. But age is a, an important social category. And I think a different and better way to approach the area is through a concept of dress rather than fashion. For this enables us to escape some of those embedded evaluations and interpretations. A focus on dress allows us to see clothing through the lens of everyday embodiment, through a concept of dress, as in Joanne Intwistle's terms, situated body practice, something that's everyday, situated, embodied, and most important, ordinary. Everyone wears clothes. And that's the approach I've taken today and in my work generally. At this point, I should perhaps say something very briefly about gender. My focus today is on women and dress, and this largely fo follows the overwhelming pattern of work on dress and fashion, which largely concentrates on women. Fashion is one of the very few fields of analysis where women represent the assumed norm. They are, for once, the default position the unmarked category, the norm. But I'm particularly pleased that Barry, um, Ben Barry is going to address masculinity of dress in the next session, so I think our two sessions should um, talk very well to each other. But I should perhaps just add that although I'm going to talk about women and age, I'm currently engaged in some work on older men and dress. So I want to suggest that dress is one of the means whereby social differences are made manifest and visible. We're familiar with this in relation to the key dimensions of difference. Gender, for example. Dress is saturated with assumptions and distinctions in relation to gender. It's absolutely central to the topic of dress. Similarly, in relation to social class, dress and class are closely linked. Think of classic early work in fashion and, and class it, from the late 19th century onward, writers like Veblen, Simmel, Bourdieu. 
Similarly, sexuality, ethnicity, religion, race, all offer key dimensions of social difference that can be expressed and often are expressed through dress. But this approach also applies to age. For age is surely one of the key social divisions and one, therefore, we might expect to find reflected in dress practices. It has, however, been neglected within cultural analyses at least. When age is analysed, it tends to be presented in terms of different and separate discourses, ones dominated by issues of medicine, frailty, public policy. But we need to recover a sense of age as a cultural phenomenon and one that deserves to be featured in cultural analyses, including the cultural analysis of material objects, in the case of what we're talking about today, clothing. In relation to age and class, uh, age and dress, I should mention briefly that I'm not going to talk today about childhood, though there's very interesting work on that, and I'm going to concentrate on aging in the sense of later years. So, Aging, in part, is about the body. We need to understand that aging is both a physical and a cultural phenomenon, and that there's indeed a complex interplay between these two in which the body and its presentation is central. Clothes lie on the boundary between the body and its social presentation. Dress is thus key to how the body is presented and enacted socially. And these processes apply as much to age as they do to other social categories. Clothes have indeed traditionally reflected this. They have traditionally been age-ordered. As a consequence, when we look at the relations between age and dress, we need to be alert to the ways in which clothes may be linked to wider shifts in disciplinary practices in relation to the body and age. Debates on dress reflect also arguments about new modes of governmentality in relation to the body. So, as we have noted, dress practices encode and reflect age as a social category. Historically, we can see this in the long-established phenomenon of age ordering in dress. I've defined age ordering as the systematic patterning of cultural expectations according to an ordered and hierarchically, and that's extremely important, hierarchically arranged concept of age. It's largely expressed negatively in terms of what people should avoid as they get older, what it becomes inappropriate for them to wear. And there's a persistent normative pattern in this age ordering they're always contained within historical specificities. Dress that is suitable for older women is typically more covered up, with higher necks, more sleeves, longer skirts. And here are some of the parallels with, with modest dress. The cut is typically looser and less body conscious. The colours are often duller and darker, with an avoidance of high saturation tones or look-at-me colours like red. It's sober, self-effacing dress that avoids making claims to sexual attention. And we can see these features illustrated in this familiar pyramid of age. And this is an American version from the mid-19th century. As you see, as we move through the life cycle from the little girl on the left to the elderly woman on the right, we observe how the clothes change to reflect her differing social positions and roles. But we also observe how the body that wears these clothes changes. We move from exposed arms, low necks, frills, fur bellows, feathers and ankles, through a more sober matronly form of dress with increasingly longer skirts, enveloping shawls and covered hair. Now this form of age ordering in dress to quite an extent still exists today. The basic patterning persists. As a result, modern designers and retailers learn to adjust the cut they offer to reflect this. They respond to social meanings about age and its expression. But in doing so, they respond not just to cultural norms, but also to physiological changes. For as the body ages, it changes. Waists thicken, busts lower, shoulders move forward, 
weight shifts from the arms and legs to the center of the body. If clothes are to fit, they need to reflect and express these changes. We can see this reflected in this image from the design studio of a British fashion company, Edinburgh Woolen Mills, that has a predominantly older market. On the left, you can see the old fit model that they used in the past. This shows some of the features of the older body, for example, the lower bust line. But on the right, you can see the new version that's based on a systematic study scanning the British population as a whole. And the model we're looking at is UK size 18, as it's characterized for the older customer. It thus represents the older woman's figure. As you'll see, it has more of the features of age, the thickening of the center of the body, the rounding of the shoulder line, the lower, fuller, and less defined bust. So the fashion industry designs in the lights of those bodily changes, but also, crucially, their cultural estimation. For not all the features of age-ordered dress are the result of physiological change. High necks, long sleeves, dull colors reflect not so much physiological aging as its cultural estimation, the shame that women feel over the public exposure of these aspects of their aging bodies. And that brings me back to the point I made earlier, that aging needs to be understood as both physical and a cultural phenomenon, that we need to focus on the complex interplay between those two elements. And we also need to recognize in this mix the powerful operation of ageism, so pervasive culturally that we often fail to see it. It's become, as it were, naturalized. We need to acknowledge how dress is, in Barnard's terms, ideological, part of the process whereby social groups establish, sustain, and reproduce relations of dominance and subordination, that hierarchical point that I made <coughs> earlier. And part of how those relations are made to appear natural, proper, legitimate. This applies to age-ordered dress as to other forms. Many of the features of age-ordered dress the drab, dull tones, the self-effacing, don't-look-at-me colors, the retreat from fashionability or display, make manifest and reinforce meanings and messages about status and value, reinforcing the marginalization and denigration of the old. They underwrite, at a visual level, the structural exclusion imposed on many older people, naturalizing, at a bodily level, processes that are social and cultural. But, have things changed? There's certainly a dominant account that suggests the idea that this cultural grayness and self-effacement has gone. It's a view that's powerfully present in the media, especially the lifestyle-oriented media, where it's frequently presented in terms of the baby boomer discourse. The idea that there's been a cultural quake affected by the baby boomer generation. And there's certainly lots of imagery around to support this. Here are some images that may well be familiar to many of you, since they're taken from the New York blog Advanced Style by um, Ariseth Cohen. These sites project a particular vision of later years and the individual's response to them. Here's an image from the blog of the accidental item, icon in which Lynn Slater presents her response to the issues of dress, appearance, and age. There's a very clear note of defiance and to some extent of transgression in these presentations, a refusal to retreat into invisibility. And there are other examples of responses that reinforce this sense of challenge and resistance. Here is the US-based Red Hat Society with its use of dress to challenge the cultural invisibility of older women. Note the bright transgressive colors in the form of red and purple. Now in my study, which was based on interviews with older women, design directors and magazine editors, I certainly found some evidence to support this interpretation, this sense of cultural change. Here's a comment from the design director of a major UK supermarket chain with a large clothing line. 
When I first started working 30 years ago, there was a point of time when people, the majority of people, would switch into that way of dressing, into classic dressing. And I should tell you, classic dressing in the UK context is, is code for older woman. <laughs> because they felt that was appropriate to their age. But that's gone. This is a massive change. I mean, a huge change in my lifetime. And the women I interview also expressed a sense that they were, very, they were very different from their mothers, and they had no intention of adopting what they saw as frumpy, aging dresses. This sort of interpretation is often associated with commentary in relation to the baby boomer generation, who have been singled out as pioneers of a radical and new approach to age. But we need to be careful here. Accounts in terms of the baby boomers tend to be very sectional, they emphasize the experience of the successful middle class, those who epitomize the dreams of consumer culture, reflected in this sort of imagery. It's a world of affluent coupledom, um, far from many older people's lives. Because baby boomers also include a lot of older people who are far from this. Think of a working class former cleaner living alone, suffering from emphysema. Technically, in terms of age cohort, she's a baby boomer, but her experiences are very far from this. So we need to be cautious about interpretations that put too heavy an emphasis on the baby boomers and on celebrationist accounts of consumer culture that fail to reflect the diversity of older people. It's useful to remember here that older people are as diverse, and did in many senses more diverse, than younger cohorts. We just often forget, I think largely for reasons of ageism, to recognize and acknowledge this. What we need, therefore, is a more nuanced account that recognizes the persistence of age-related norms. They haven't gone away. Older women still face what we could call the changing room moment. Here's a classic expression of this from my study. A respondent in her 60s describes this changing room moment. I'm very sad. I'm very upset. I mean, some of the stars are quite gorgeous. I'd love to be able to wear them. When you're in the changing room and you say, oh, goodness, is that me? And I just think, no, no, I can't wear it anymore. It's a lovely style, and I just can't wear it. I just feel very sad. And then I've got to look for something that's more appropriate for my age. <laughs> like that hiss at the front. <laughs> This final image reflects on this central relationship of embodiment, fashion, and age. Um, here, once again, we have the familiar pyramid of age, though this time in relation to men. And at an immediate reading, it seems to say, yes, things have changed. We all wear the same clothes in this context described in terms of the rise of casual wear, presented here as in terms of a lifetime in baby wear. But, at the same time, we see we're not all wearing the same clothes. There are still distinct patterns of age ordering. Look at the appearance of elastic waists at the beginning and end of the cycle. Also the shorter, sexier cut of the shorts. And the way these star features intersect with physiological change, the ways that the body inhabit, that inhabits these subtly different versions also changes. So that returns me to my concluding remarks, to the, in my concluding remarks to the central theme of this conference, the relationship between fashion and physique, or fashion and the body. As I suggested earlier, age needs to be understood as both a physiological and a cultural phenomena, and there is indeed a complex interplay between the two. There are aspects of dress and age that reflect physiological change. We saw this in the ways in which designers and retailers adjust the cut of their clothes to respond in systematic ways to the ways that the bodies alter as they age. But we also noted how most of those, indeed many of the features of age-related dress, are cultural. They say things, they embody things about the meaning and estimation of being old. Until recently, fashion studies as a field have tended to evade these areas, seeing them as marginal and unfashionable, certainly far from the dizzy, glamorous world of high fashion with its hyperbolic language, its commitments to style. 
But older people represent an increasingly significant portion of the population. They too wear clothes. They too express meanings by means of them. They buy things. Focusing our analysis on older people on age as a social and cultural category thus enables us to see aspects of dress that can be obscured by too heavy a focus on fashion, aspects that reflect the ordinary, the day-to-day, -day, and the mainstream. Thank you. So again, I'd like to invite anybody that might have some questions to come up. Yes. Hi, yes, I have a question. Um, so what do you suggest you say to people, for example, um, I have an aunt who constantly tells me that at my age I should not be wearing such and such, even though I'm slim. She says, oh, well, you can't wear this or that. And she forcibly made me give like a mini skirt away to one of my little nieces. Oh. Uh, what, you know, I didn't want to get into a fight with her. You know, I love her, and I know she means well. Um, but <laughs> what do you say to people like that, you know, in a gracious way? Um, you know, I could use some help with that. Well, I suppose, I suppose you could be kind of um, sly about it and not wear the miniskirt when you visit her. But I, I, think, I think you just have to say that... Well, the simplest thing, obviously, is to say times have changed. They're shifting. There's no reason why I shouldn't wear a miniskirt. I think I look good in it. I think that's probably the answer rather than trying to challenge her directly. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm nervous to speak because I don't know how magnified my voice will be. Um, so I'm wondering if you could um, illuminate a bit from your research as well. I'm wondering if the same phenomenon is happening uh, that we heard of earlier where uh, the stout size fashion is really sort of an endeavor to conform, to get the stout or plus size body to um, look more appealing to you know, society's construct of what the acceptable ideal body is to make it look slender. So is, do you find sort of for, you know, when you were speaking with designers who are keeping the older uh, customer in mind, is it that they're just simply sort of saying, you know, splash a lot of red and make things glittery and shiny to make them look younger? Is that sort of phenomenon also that parallel happening? Um, there's a very dominant discourse in fashion magazines. It's typically done nowadays in terms of ageless style. So rather than sort of say um, overtly, though sometimes they do how to look younger, as it were, yes. um, it's also presented in terms of there's a kind of agelessness that transcends. But it's essentially about making a successful a success of wearing younger looking clothes. Um, so there, I think there are very direct parallels. I think one of the interesting parallels that struck me about the plus size issue was that one of the ways in which you can... It's very difficult to... Um, tell from the outside whether a particular retailer is aimed at the older market because none of them ever, ever use that language. And they, yeah. they do that for very obvious reasons. Older women don't want to go into a shop that says this is for older women. <laughs> Um, so it has to be conveyed subtly. And so one of the ways it's often in the past been conveyed is to do with size, in that it typically that start of fashion that we looked at in the interwar years was being worn by older women. And so there's a, there's a very inter interesting intersection there. But I think one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is that th those larger sizes, the plus sizes, are also younger women. So that, that's a, a, a change that's occurred. If there's no one else, can I double dip with another question? Um, so I'm also going to repeat, I think, another question that was asked earlier as well. I mean, I noticed even, obviously, this is a very, very brief uh, slideshow, but some of the examples are sort of, you know, the, the push against the machine. Some of the images that you showed were white older women. So I'm wondering also, too, um, in a lot of the media or representation, are you also seeing, because, again, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these... Um, you know, some of the norms that you've mentioned, I think from what I know of, you know, other cultures, communities, women of color, people of color, I think a lot of them sort of, you know, flout a lot of this, um, you know, based on how they dress and embrace sort of fullness of body, et cetera. So I'm just wondering too, do you find that coming up in the conversation as well? Yes, I mean, I think there are interesting ways in which different um, social groups, different cultural groups um, do, do reflect this in their style. And I think uh, plus size, um, responses among women of colour move across into 
also into age to some degree. Yes, and I think there like are. They also some... sort of more gracefully sort of transition yes. rather than I trying think... to look younger, but try to. Um, in other words, to be very, very honest, the lady that was mm. before me, I can't imagine someone, you know, fr from different cultures, maybe they wouldn't say, you know, you're too old at this point. I think they would more sort of gracefully embrace, you know, sort of the, the aging. So I'm just wondering, yeah. That's... I'd need to reflect on that. Um, mm. I, I don't want to be too easily optimistic in that I think that the discourse of you're too old for that is really quite deeply and quite long historically established. So I, I, I'd be cautious about responding, but I'll certainly think much more about it. Thank, Thank you, you for mentioning that.